life never has existed yet that someone at some point in time hasn't encountered or run across having issues to deal with the whole idea of problems. Problems happen. They occur. They are neither good nor bad. They are simply an existence of there being a conflict of some type that requires a resolution. And whether you admit it or not, a problem really, from God's perspective, is a benefit to you if you choose to observe it in the way that he has designated it to come into your life for a plan and a purpose to cause in your life some type of teaching, learning opportunity, training, or evaluative process that will cause you to know him in a more intimate and personal way than you have before. Problems in life are often faced by those who have them in a variety of ways. Most of the ways that people deal with problems are to avoid them, to hide from them, to run away from them, to not deal with them. Because unless the answer is simple, most people don't want to deal with problems. I think you've often heard the term problem solvers. There are people that are very gifted and very qualified to do certain things when it comes to problems. And we look at them and their ability to take a problem and come up with a solution and we call them problem solvers because they can do them very easily, very quickly. In life, though, as opposed to business, life, as God has said is true, will be full of problems that you are going to face one way or another. Whether you will admit that you have a problem or you admit that there are problems that you are going to face, sooner or later, a problem is going to hit you face to face and you're going to have to deal with it and come to some kind of conclusion of what you're going to do with that problem, how you're going to resolve it, what you're going to get from it, or what you're going to do with it. We as Christians often realize that God is going to use a problem to get our attention. Now once he has our attention, it's up to him to discern for us, to tell us, to explain to us what that problem is for. Why did it happen? What did it happen for? What is the purpose of it? What can I get from it? How am I going to learn from it? There are five areas that we can get the greatest benefit from our problems because we will obviously deal with the problem one way or another. And the variety of problems that there are, you can't say there's one specific answer of how to deal with the problem because the problem itself will have its own answer, usually, simply by seeking the Lord and asking Him for His solution. But the fact that there is a problem means that there's also a purpose for it. And the purpose is for us to derive something from it or to get something out of it. And so in order for us to get the greatest benefit from it, to get the greatest reward from that problem that we're facing, we are training ourselves and teaching ourselves to look at how to deal with and how to appreciate the problems that we face. James, the entire book of James, really describes a lot about problems. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall in diverse trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations are problems. So five of the ways that we looked at them are the benefit of getting more grace from God the benefit of self-examination, the benefit of new insight in scripture, the benefit of unifying the family, and the benefit of uniting the families of a church. So, today we're looking at the benefit of self-examination. That process of determination that we look at ourselves and we have a criteria that we are examining ourselves by. We have a list, as it were, that we measure up to. We have a process of looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, oh, I see myself. And we have to evaluate whether we do so correctly or incorrectly. We have to understand what we're seeing and then applying it appropriately. Because it's easy to deceive ourselves by saying, oh, well, I don't need to look in the mirror. I know me. Really. That's what the doctor would say. You see, when you go to a doctor and you don't feel so good, you know, you've got kind of an ache underneath your, your back left lower quadrant. And you kind of go, you know, it aches back here all the time and I can't figure it out. And he takes an x-ray and he says, you've got kidney stones. 
He says, you can't solve it. He says, you know, these are going to have to come out another way. We're going to have to take care of it. Now, there could be surgery, or there could be, you know, I can't think of what it's called. But anyway, it's a type of, you know, blowing kidneys apart, or kidney stones apart. But the part being is that when you have a kidney stone, you don't know you have it. You know you have the pain from it. You have a problem with pain, but the source of the pain is that kidney stone that has blocked some of the little tubes inside, you know, and you need to get rid of that kidney stone or it'll make you sick. You could get worse. You could even possibly, although it's far-fetched, die from it. And you can die from kidney stones. But the point being is that the pain is the problem. You want to resolve the problem, the pain. Then you find out that the problem has a reason and a purpose to it. And that's the same thing that happens in life. There's a purpose and a reason for the problems in your life that God wants you to derive the benefit from. God requires that each of us, every single human being that calls himself in the name of the Lord by Christian or being a follower of Jesus, God requires that each of us maintain a periodic program of self-examination. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. If, and that's always the qualifier, would you do what God tells you to do or would you ignore? Whenever you see an if, there's always that capability to make a choice, whether you will obey or disobey. It's not a question of just, well, preferences. No, it's a question of obedience. Will you do it? Because God doesn't say and force you to do it, but out of love, you would choose to do it if you will obey. But if you won't, then of course you're in disobedience and you'll find yourself frustrating the grace that's been given to you. It's like when the doctor says, hey, you have kidney stones. I want you to come back tomorrow so we could schedule surgery. And you don't go back. And you never once again talk to the doctor. The kidney stones might go away, but they might not. So you see, whether you obey or disobey, you still have the initial reason and problem that existed in the first place, the kidney stones. And you might still have the pain, which is the problem that you were trying to get rid of in the first place. The two are connected. Unless you do what you're supposed to do, then you cannot resolve the things that you want to do in getting rid of the problem or getting the benefit from the problem. The benefit from the problem would be to clear up the kidney stone by getting rid of the pain because the only way to get rid of the pain would be by clearing up the kidney stone. Then you're healthy again and you feel good. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. God uses the word chasten a lot in the King James. Chasten is to often when you see someone riding a horse, you know, they use a little whip, you know, kind of kick the heels or they'll whip the horse or they'll go, you know, and then slap the reins because it's like a surprise. It's a shock. It wakes you up. It's like, oh, he wants me to go. Okay. It's kind of like a slap on the face or a cold splash of water in the morning. It wakes you up. It's not meant to hurt you. It's meant to alarm you or to waken you up. It's meant to bring you out of your sleep. It's kind of like a shock therapy, so to speak in a way that will cause you to react in the way that God wants you to act. He wants you to pay attention. Wake up. Look at me. Here. Listen. And that's what chastening does. Our problems chasten us, and if the Lord loves you, then he says, look, I'm trying to tell you, don't go out in the street. Stupid. <laughs> and he doesn't do it that way. But, you know, he may cause certain circumstances in your life to remind you of the things that he's already warned you of so that you would begin to do them in a better way rather than the way that you're doing. And so he chooses the word chasteneth in order to slap you, to whip you, to tell you, to make you go in a different direction because you're obviously heading in the wrong direction. You have a problem. Now he's trying to get your attention with it and say, look, I've already spoken to you, whispered in your ear. Now I'm trying to get a little more attention out of you and say, hey, this is what i got to say. You're not coming back to the doctor's office. Now I'm tracking you down. The pain got more severe. That's the chastening of the Lord. When things are going well for us, we are not easily motivated for this activity. In other words, whenever things are right, we don't go and schedule an appointment with the doctor for our regular checkup. Some people do. They go and get a checkup after they're 50 regularly for maybe proctoscopy or maybe... Uh, 
for women, uh, breast screening or you know, breast cancer screening, or maybe for you know, any number of reasons, you go to your doctor and you decide to get an evaluation of how well you're doing. When you're in church, it never hurts to get together in a fellowship that actually has a discipleship program where you're growing and becoming disciples, where you actually do pay attention to each other and you say, hey, you know, let's have a checkup about once a year. You know, let's kind of like have a talk, a sit down. You know, I personally believe that pastors should do that regularly with their flock and then with their fellow pastors. And sometimes churches do that in what they call seminars or going to a, a conference, you know. I personally don't think conferences amount to much. No offense to the conference speakers and the conferences, but I'm not so convinced that that's all that they're cracked up to be. But I could be wrong. They're nice for getting extra teaching and, you know, something that they might not get otherwise, but I don't see it really as an accountability thing or more as a developmental thing. That really a boils down to a self-examination. And a self-examination should be that way that you can actually be honest with yourself once you've discipled with others to come to that place where you can evaluate yourself and know your own faults as well as your own successes and failings. We should be able to give an accounting of ourselves, both the good and the bad. Whenever you have a resume, you're always putting forward your best foot forward. And in business, we're taught that and in the world. But your wife probably knows you better than you do if you're married. And if not, then your mother or somebody that's close and intimate with you would know you, especially God knows the inside of you and knows you way better. But the point is, when you examine yourself, you're more open to letting God add to that examination His insight so that He can begin to show you, like a doctor would, exactly where the problem lies deep inside in your kidneys with the kidney stones. So when a major conflict arises and our spirit is grieved, we have the most effective motivation to search out the inner motives, actions, words, deeds, and attitudes of our heart. So when we see ourselves running into conflicts like everywhere we go, like, well, how come I just got in a fight with my wife? And then I got in a fight with my kids. Then I got in a fight, you know, at church. Then I got in a fight at the job. And now I got in a fight, you know, in, you know, the community because I got arrested for a DUI. You might have a drinking problem. Could be. So you see, there's more to the story about problems than meets the eye. A problem is the recommendation by God forcefully demonstrating to you, do something. Pay attention. Use this as an opportunity to grow through by doing a self-examination. When you have a problem, if you're like me, the first thing I do is, oh Lord, what's going on? Just right off the bat, okay Lord, what's going on? Uh, something's not right. There's a problem here. I'm not quite sure what it is yet, but I'm open. So open my eyes to what it might be. Open my ears to what you might tell me. Let me see with my understanding the purpose you have for it, but then also, God, with this problem, let me see what I can grow from. Let me see what I can know from this problem that might be a part of my life I can make applicable to myself so that I could learn from it so I don't have to repeat whatever it is that's happening either to my life or from my life. And I watch that and see that in other people's lives, and I like to kind of like see how they deal with it and kind of adapt it to myself. Because I say, hey, you know, if they did that, then I'm going to try it. And if it works for them, it will work for me, I'll try it. If it don't work for me, I'll get rid of it. And so you see, that's part of the problem benefit making process that we can use a problem to get a benefit from by the self-examination. We say, am I the source of the problem or am I just the object of the problem being a learning lesson for me to discover and uncover what the truth of God is in this situation and circumstances. He wants me to know what I should learn from this in the process so I can grow more as a man of God than I am today and that I will be tomorrow. And that's what God wants to do with problems. He doesn't want you to walk around saying and listening to everybody, oh, I got this problem, I got that problem, and you know, I just this, but I don't know what to do, and I got, you know, <laughs> And that's what a person does when they got problems. They want to whine. They want to complain. They want to tell everyone about their problem. Don't. Examine yourself. Is what we're saying here. 
and number two, the benefit of self-examination, because the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching out the innermost parts of his being, Proverbs 20, 27. This is what precisely what God meant when he said, the reproofs of the instruction are the way of life, Proverbs 6, 23. Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. So let's backtrack that for a minute. The reproofs of instruction are the way of life. What is the way of life? Reproof of instruction. Instructions means something is told to you to do and it's reproving you of your actions that were wrong to make you do actions that are right. It's choosing to tell you to do something differently than what you've been doing previously so that you'll no longer do the wrong thing but you'll do the right thing. In other words, if you keep crossing the street jaywalking, you're going to get a ticket. So the reproof of instruction is that with which says, hey, stop doing what you're doing. You're breaking the law. Now the problem and the benefit of it would be if you got a ticket from a police officer that cited you for jaywalking. You'd say, well, that's a stupid ticket. It's a misdemeanor and I've got to pay some money now. That's just a pain in the butt. Yeah, and then you look out and you see a little child crawl out to the street and get hit by a car. Now, you're smarter than a child crawling out in the street, but the demonstration of what the consequences of an action are can be made applicable to you by way of learning from that circumstances that if you would obey my words, then you would not suffer the fruit of your own actions. You reap what you sow. Chickens come home to roost. That with which comes around, goes around, goes around, comes around, does all those kinds of things all around the town. But the point being is simply that God said it, so it will happen. So you do it. And that's why the real proof of instruction is simply that, hey, I'm telling you, these are my instructions in the Word of God. If you don't do them, this is the consequence. And that's what God is always trying to do in the way of life when he says that there are principles of life. Because the book that we are living is called The Way, The Truth, The Light. Jesus said, in him was life, and in him was light. And that light was the life of men. Well, anyways, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something else. The life that God has given us is very obviously laid out before him from beginning to end. We're the ones that are going through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse as we experience it in the same way that the book of life, the Bible is written from the beginning until the end, living it through from beginning to end, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and you'll see that your life really is applicable to all the different characters and people and places and things that have happened in the scriptures and that you're going through the same process that they did. You were learning the principles, dealing with the problems, coming up with the solutions, being reproved by the instructions that are in it, being taught by the lessons that are of it, and finding out that you were to discover for yourself by self-examination the benefits from it. This book that we call the Bible, that is the book of life for you, the instruction book so that you could live a more profitable, abundant life that would be fulfilled and filled with the presence of God to the completeness of your soul, that you would come to heaven completely filled up with joy and peace and love, which is what God wants you to have now, as well as to be overwhelmed by when you appear in heaven before him. He wants to see you with joy, with peace, and with harmony in your life. Not with all the problems that you can count on your Bible bill, you know, that you notched, kind of like, you know, said, hey, I had this problem, I overcame, I won, I won, I won, I won, I won, I lost, I won, I lost, I won, and you measure yourself out according to some scales that you have in your own mind. But rather, when we examine ourselves, we find ourselves failing in the measurement of what God would have us to learn from the reality of self-examination. And that is simply the determination that we can't do it ourselves. We are no longer able to be self-determinant. We can't because we can't see. We're blind men walking through the world that we look at and we have no idea why the things happen that they do. And the majority of us are always asking the reason why. And God doesn't want you to ask why when a problem comes up. He wants to ask you what when a problem comes up. What can I learn from it? How can I get the most out of this? What is the benefit to me that I might be able to profit from it so that I would see all that God has in store for me from it? And that self-examination is looking at the problem that way. That self-examination is also looking at it from the point of view that you may be the one who's being instructed and being taught 
to do something different than what you've been doing because you may have the problem emanating from your own actions or from your interactions with people. And that the reality of who you are will be determined by what you do with the problems that you face and how you get through them. Because it's not just a question anymore, since you learned the principles of life, of looking at a problem and saying, let's get rid of the problem, you know, the pain, without dealing with the reality of the kidney stones that are causing the pain. But the reality of all of life is simply knowing the fact that God is in control of every nuanced circumstance, hair on your head, and every breath you take, and every move you make. And every time you see the wind blow, or every time you see the, the sky, and the sunrise, and the sunset, and the darkness come, and the night fall, you'll know that God is in control of all of these things if you will see them, including your problems, as sent by and directed with the purpose in mind that God wants to get your attention and He wants you to benefit from the problems you're facing as you go through the design that He has for your life as you begin to implement or to put into practice the principles of life that He has for you today to learn from so that you won't fear for the morrow, because tomorrow will take care of itself, but that you'll enjoy today and you'll even rejoice when you come into problems like James says, because you'll see that they're working and producing a new patience and a way of looking at problems that you never thought you would have looked at them before. And that's the greatest benefit that you're going to get out of all of these things when it comes to the principles of life and taking God at his word, in his word, according to the word that he said unto you as you're going through the resolution of that problem and deriving the best and greatest benefit that you possibly can from that problem because you know that it came from the hand of God and God has a reason for it, for you to learn and for you to apply to your life.